So the general land office um, is led by the commissioner, sometimes called the commissioner of the general land office, uh, sometimes called the Texas land commissioner. This is the building where it's headquartered in, in Austin. And the main role of the land office is to manage Texas's publicly owned lands. And that's a lot of land. Texas owns and manages 20.3 million acres. And that includes beaches and submerged land that goes 10.3 miles into the Gulf of Mexico, which I'm going to talk about quite a bit today. Um, a side issue of this is Texas uh, manages royalties and proceeds from land leases and land sales and from the leasing of mineral rights to this land. And since oil has been discovered in much of this land, including the submerged lands off the coast, that, uh, that is a lot of money, right? Millions and millions of dollars per year. And the proceeds from a lot of this are sent to the permanent school fund, fund which helps to pay for our public schools. The permanent school fund has received about $6.1 billion last time I checked since it was created in 1854, and it currently has an endowment of over $48 billion, which means that's much, how much is saved. And it gets about $700 million each year, $700 million more. So it's a huge amount of money that the land office is in charge of overseeing uh, the uh, creation of right, through Texas's land. The current commissioner of the land office is this guy, George P. Bush. Uh, this will be his last term. He was first elected in 2014. He was reelected in 2018. He decided not to seek a third term. Instead, he uh, tried in the Republican primary <clears throat> to replace the current uh, attorney general, Ken Paxton. He did not win the primary. Ken Paxton was re-nominated by the Republican Party to run for a second or third term. So I don't know what George Bush's future plans are, but he won't be the commissioner of the land office after the next court, uh, after the next election. Now, the general land office was created in 1836. <clears throat> it was created when Texas was an independent republic, right after the War of Independence from Mexico. So that makes this the oldest Texas public agency oldest continually still existing Texas public agency. This is the former home, the historic landmark uh, in Austin. So its constitutional purpose when it was created in 1836 was to superintend, execute, and perform all acts touching or respecting the public lands of Texas. It's also responsible for keeping records of land grants and titles, and for issuing maps and surveys of public lands. It has a Spanish archives division with depositories for the records of 4,200 Spanish and Mexican land grants. These land grants are still considered valid by Texas. They were valid under the Republic of Texas and today, so people still use those archives to research uh, those Spanish and Mexican land grants. And those land grants cover about over 26 million acres of land in Texas, so that's a significant amount of land that's still relevant. One interesting thing about Texas, and I'll highlight this a little bit more when I get to <clears throat> the Tidelands controversy, there's something about Texas that's different from every other state. When Texas joined the Union, 1845, when it was annexed to the United States, it kept control of its public lands. It did so because it was coming into the Union as a sovereign state, as an independent country. Uh, the only other country that's done that, I would say, is Hawaii, which was a republic for only four years. But I don't know if anyone else recognizes it as a legitimate republic. But Texas was uh, recognized by many nations including the United States as an independent republic. So Texas retained all of its public lands and all of the lands in Texas today that are federal lands were acquired either by being purchased by the federal government or by, by being donated 
by Texas to the federal government. So that kind of segs into the an interesting controversy that happened about 70 years ago and that kind of involves the General Land Office a little bit, and that's the Tidelands Controversy. And you've probably never heard of it before in your life, but this was at one point in the 1950s considered the most important controversy in Texas by many Texans. So first the definition, Tidelands are the territory between the tide line of seacoasts and lands, the low water or the low tide, to, um, to the limit of that tide. And these are considered the territorial waters of a nation. And in Texas, this involved about 2.4 million acres of submerged land. And one of the interesting things about Texas is for other states, the land that's considered uh, submerged land that belongs to other states is about three miles. So from the low tide point of the coast, going out into the ocean about three miles, that's considered state land for Florida, for California, for all the other states. But Texas is unique. Texas was an independent nation. And in the treaty that Texas signed with Mexico when it became independent, and then in the treaty that Texas signed with Texas, with the United States, when it was annexed, Texas claimed, and the rest of the world agreed, including the United States, that Texas owned the submerged lands 10 miles out into the ocean, or 10.3. Three leagues, or 10.3 miles. So Texas has roughly three times more submerged land, more ocean land, than other states do. And this became an important point during this controversy. So the oil, the ownership of this property was claimed by Texas, it was recognized by the United States as a valid Texas claim for more than 100 years until oil was discovered in these submerged lands and oil leases became very valuable and then a controversy ensued. The controversy that ensued was not just limited to Texas. Uh, other states, although they had claims to only three miles of land, they still had claims to valuable land California, Florida, and other states. And so it was a multi-state controversy, but Texas was what kind of the focal point of the controversy. Texas had the most to lose, and Texas was one of the main fighters against the federal government. Uh, so it became a national issue. It involved three Supreme Court decisions, three acts of Congress, uh, multiple presidential vetoes. Uh, it became a major part of the 1952 presidential election. It was a big deal 70 years ago. One of the reasons it was such a big deal is because of that permanent school fund that I mentioned earlier. Texans were really dependent upon the money, the Texas government was, the money that came from these oil leases because it used that money to pay into the school fund to support the public schools in Texas. It was such an important issue that in 1949, while the controversy was still very hot, there was a statewide public opinion poll that reported that Texans thought this was the most important issue facing the state. Texans accused the federal government of trying to steal or expropriate Texas's land. And Texas was indignant because like I said earlier, the United States had recognized Texas's claim in the actual papers of the annexation and the agreements that were signed. So Texas's claim to this land went all the way back to 1836. Here's a painting of Sam Houston, the general who won Texas's independence against Mexico. He's meeting here with the president of Mexico, Santa Ana, on the battlefield at San Jacinto. They drew up a map and a treaty recognizing Texas's borders and recognizing Texas's claim to this submerged land 10.3 miles into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, the boundary and the 10.3 mile submerged land claim was recognized by President Andrew Jackson and the United States government. Of course, Texas wasn't part of the United States yet, but when the U.S. officially recognized Texas's legitimacy as an independent nation, 
they recognize the legitimacy of these land claims as well. Uh, the Texas's Navy defended this claim uh, during the 10 years that Texas was an independent country, and the Congress of Tex Texas insisted that any future annexation to the United States recognize this as the legitimate land claim. This is a uh, picture of President James Polk. He was the president in 1940, 1845, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> when Texas was finally formally annexed into the United States at the end of that year, and Polk vowed to maintain the Texian title to the extent which she claims it to be, meaning he promised that what Texas claims its boundaries are, that's what the United States will enforce and recognize. And of course, Texas claimed its boundaries, you know, three leagues or 10.3 miles into the ocean. Uh, the Supreme Court recognized kind of at the same time with regards to other states that whatever land claims they had going into statehood upon becoming states were, they retained after they became states. In other words, when a, when a territory became a part of the United States, it didn't lose its land. It didn't, subs it didn't uh, concede its land to the federal government. And of course, so Texas becomes a part of the United States. And according to the Supreme Court decisions, Texas would get to keep the land it already claimed. But even more so because we had the annexation treaty and the languages therein saying that Texas had this claim to uh, three leagues. So the Republic of Texas received the following specific assurances to all of its lands and the annexation agreement of March 1, 1845. And it said this, that Congress, that's the Congress of the United States, doth consent that the territory properly included within and rightfully belonging to the Republic of Texas may be erected into a new state to be called the state of Texas. And said state shall also retain all the vacant and unoccupied land, unappropriated lands lying within its limits. So it seems very clear that the United States was specifically acknowledging the legitimacy of Texas's claims, its territorial or boundary claims. After the war with Mexico in 1848, uh, it, was fought between 1846 and 1848. The Texas legislature insisted that in the future, in the uh, treaty ending the war with Mexico, that that treaty acknowledge Texas's lands claim, land claims again. And it did. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848 ended the war between the United States and Mexico. And it acknowledged Texas's land claims, just as the other documents had. And then in 1853, five years later, there's another treaty with Mexico, the Gadsden Purchase. Again, Texas insisted that its land claims be acknowledged in that treaty, and it was done. So the three league or 10.3 mile boundary into the Gulf of Mexico was acknowledged again and again and again, right? In the annexation, in the two treaties with Mexico, and so forth. In addition to all that, whenever the United States, for the next 100 years or so, whenever the United States wanted to build a port or a lighthouse or anything like that on Texas's land, on Texas's uh, uh, Gulf Coast, it acknowledged this three league or 10.3 mile uh, claim of Texas's that it owned that much land. Now, there we go. But then, go, uh, oil was discovered, and the oil underneath these submerged lands became very, very valuable. And Texas, along with other states like California and Florida, where there's oil to be found began leasing the mineral rights for millions and millions of dollars to oil companies. So they would explore, they would extract the oil, they would sell it, and Texas would get millions of dollars from the school fund from these leases. At about the same time, 
people began making claims to federal leases on these lands. So by 1950, there were over a thousand people who had applied for federal leases on state lands in Texas, California, and Florida. And the federal leases were given much, much cheaper than the Texas leases and the other state leases. So I want you to see kind of the competing incentives here. Texas wants to keep its claim, as well as the other states do, because it's getting millions of dollars from leasing the lands to oil companies. The oil companies would rather lease the land from the federal government because the federal government offers them cheaper leases. The federal government wants to have the land for itself because even though it's offering cheaper leases, it's getting the money itself, right? And so they're all competing for valuable land, right? And that sets up the competition that becomes the tied lands controversy. So this is uh, the man who was a Texas Attorney General for several years while the controversy raged. And he was kind of, the, the Texas Attorney General represents Texas in legal disputes before the Supreme Court or in other federal courts. And, um, and so he did a lot of the fighting on Texas' behalf. Well, the battle began when the United States sued California in 1946 over the rights to its off-coast land. So they basically wanted to take that land away from California and say it was now federal land, and so the federal government would be in charge of all the leases. Well, the other states, like Texas and Florida and about six other states, realized that we were threatened by this too. If California lost, then Texas could lose, Alabama could lose, Florida could lose, et cetera. So they all got in on the lawsuit, and this guy, Price Daniel, actually uh, did the job of defending all of the states before the Supreme Court. Now, while the lawsuit was pending before the court, Congress passed a bill. The United States Congress recognizing the validity of the state claims to the law coast land, including Texas. So Congress was trying to go against what the courts were doing and say, the states have the better argument, Texas has the better argument, it's their land that they passed the law, clarifying that. President Harry Truman vetoed the law. So that's an important point for political reasons. So Truman vetoed the law. The Supreme Court heard the arguments from Texas and California and the federal government. Excuse me. And in 1947, the Supreme Court decided against California, and effectively in doing so against Texas and all the other states as well. This decision shocked lawyers and state officials across the country, and it became one of the most widely criticized opinions in the state of the court. It was written by this guy, Hugo Black, and he basically said even though the states had claimed and possessed these submerged offshore lands in good faith, and they had been backed up by Supreme Court decisions going back 100 years, he said, bare legal title or mere property ownership wasn't very important. What was important was that these lands might be valuable to the federal government and important for military or foreign relations business. And I think what he meant by that was we had just won World War II, uh, the oil industry was hugely beneficial for us in winning World War II. It kind of fueled the American and the British and the, the, the Russian war efforts. And so he thought of this as sort of a national security issue. He said, the crucial question on the merits is not merely who owns the bare legal title to the lands under the marginal sea. The United States here asserts rights in two capacities transcending those of a mere property owner. And the two capacities were foreign policy and military necessity. And so he was basically saying the military needs and the foreign policy needs of the United States trump the property rights of the states. And this upstates, upset the states a lot. They considered this an outrageous decision. Texas didn't think it had lost all hope though. This guy was the United States Attorney General. His name was Tom Clark. Uh, 
He was the U.S. Attorney General under Harry Truman, President Truman, and he said that the California decision didn't apply to Texas. That's the Hugo Black decision I just mentioned. He said as a republic, it owned all the lands within its boundaries, including the marginal sea, commonly called tidelands. This area was under the sovereignty of Texas during the republic and was retained by it under the provisions of the act of admission. So he's basically saying, don't worry, Texas, the California decision doesn't, doesn't relate to you. Right? It doesn't pertain to you because unlike California, you are an independent country. And you have this treaty of annexation, which acknowledges your right to all these lands. So you know, don't worry about it. Well, President Truman said the same thing. He was campaigning for president in Austin on September 20, 1948. This is only two months, less than two months before the presidential election. And he says, Texas is in a class by itself. It entered the union by treaty. So he's saying, also, don't worry. California decision doesn't apply to you. The Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ickes, said the same thing. He was a former Secretary of the Interior. This is October 1948, just a month before the election. He said, Texas may have the legal right to its tied lands because it came to the Union voluntarily and is an independent country. So these are all officials from the Truman administration saying Texas can keep its tied lands, its submerged lands. Well, Truman won the election in 1948. And Texas voted for Truman. Texas had only voted Republican once in the previous 100 years. Uh, so it wasn't really a surprise that Texas voted for Truman, who was a Democrat. But shortly after the election, Truman betrayed his promise to Texas. He told his attorney general to file suit against Texas to claim all of the submerged lands that he had been saying belonged to Texas before the election. Texas lost the lawsuit. Uh, it was, uh, they lost in a summary judgment, which means there wasn't even a trial. Texas didn't even have a chance to present evidence. Texas was supported by other authorities of international law, it was su supported by other states, but by a vote of four to three, the Supreme Court uh, decided against Texas. Justice William Douglas is the guy who made this decision, and he held that the transfer of national sovereignty to the United States and admission as a state accomplished a transfer of the submerged lands to the United States. So even though the annexation treaty said that Texas retained all of its lands, he said otherwise. He said when Texas was transferred, be annexed to the United States, States, it transferred its title to the submerged lands to the United States, somehow. Um, I don't know what his theory of is how, because it doesn't make any sense, but that was his ruling. So, along comes the election of 1952. Now, Truman is not running for election, re-election. He's so unpopular that he has no chance of being re-elected. But remember, Texans felt betrayed because he had lied to them. He had said, you can have your tide lands, they're yours. And then just a month or two after being winning the election, he had tried to, to take the front Texas uh, by a lawsuit. Well, in the 1952 campaign, General Dwight Eisenhower, the Republican candidate, made special recognition of the rights of Texas under the annexation agreement, as well as the long recognized rights of the other states under earlier Supreme Court decisions. So he declared himself in favor of state ownership legislation and said he would sign the bill if it were enacted again by Congress. Remember, Truman had vetoed a bill four years earlier that had said Texas and these other states own their tide lands, and Truman had vetoed it. Ike says if they do it again, if they give him the same bill again, he'll sign it. And he says Texas and the other states are right. The Democratic nominee was a guy named Adlai Stevenson. He agreed with Truman. He said he would veto the bill if Congress passed it again. Remember, this was considered the most important political issue in Texas at the time. 
So for the first time, no, only the second time, for only the second time in Texas's history, Texas voted Republican that year. And Texas would vote for Ike again four years later. Uh, two times in a row, Texas would vote for him uh, after 100 years of almost exclusively voting for Democrats. In fact, this issue was so important that the Texas Democratic Party urged its members to all vote for Eisenhower instead of Stevenson because of this tied lands issue. So the tied lands bill was reintroduced. Price Daniel, the guy I mentioned earlier who was uh, the Texas Attorney General who fought in front of the Supreme Court, he was now a senator and he co-wrote the bill. Another Texas senator, Lyndon Johnson, you can see here over on the right, uh, they're all standing behind Eisenhower and celebrating with him as he signs the Tidelands Bill, restoring the submerged lands to Texas and the other states. And of course, remember, in Texas, that's three times as much submerged land as it is for the other states. So he signed the measure on May 22, 1953. There was one last battle. Four years later, the Attorney General, Herbert Brownell, this is the U.S. Oh, sorry. So the U.S. Attorney General, uh, Herbert Brownell, this was Eisenhower's Attorney General, but for some reason he decided that despite the Submerged Lands Act uh, and Eisenhower, who was in his party and his administration signing it, he would sue Texas again for claim to the submerged lands on behalf of the federal government. Eisenhower publicly dis disagreed with him, said he's wrong, the legislation gives the land to Texas, it was always Texas's land anyway, uh, but they went to court and it was finally, the dispute was ended in 1960 when Texas won the lawsuit in the Supreme Court. And this was the third Supreme Court decision related to these issues and the first one that Texas had clearly had won. So that finally ended the legal dispute and after 1960, uh, Texas's claim to this 2.4 million acres of submerged land uh, was recognized as valid by the federal government not to be challenged again. Now I wanna talk briefly about Another interesting issue or controversy involving uh, the Texas Veterans Land Board, the Texas General Land Office. So the Texas General Land Office oversees something called the Veterans Land Board and the Veterans Land Fund, which, own, which loans money to Texas veterans to buy rural land. The program was created after World War II. Texas Texas's legislature enacted the Veterans Land Act in November of 1946. Uh, the Veterans Land Act issued $25 million in bonds, and bonds are loans, right? They're loaning money to the public. And the proceeds of these would be used by the state government to purchase land and resell it to veterans at 3% interest on 40-year loans. In 1951, the legislature appropriated another 75 million for the same purpose. The only stipulations were that the loans could not be for more than $7,500, and the tracts of land could not be less than 20 acres, and a 5% down payment was required, and the land could not be resold for three years. You don't need to memorize all those details, but the main idea is they're gonna loan uh, money to veterans for a cheap interest rate, 3% is a pretty good rate, to buy land, right? That's the main idea. This is the commissioner of the General Land Office at the time. His name was Bascom Giles. He said the state of Texas can make no finer gesture than assisting the Texas veteran to acquire what he wants most and what he most deserves, a parcel of the land he fought for. So he fought hard on behalf of the Veterans Land Program. He was a very popular commissioner of the land office. He had been elected eight or nine times, which was unprecedented uh, popularity in the history of the land office. He was considered a future candidate for governor 
Uh, he was such a successful politician at the time. And it turns out the reason he was such a big fan of the Veterans Land Program is because he was a crook and he was getting rich off of it. So they, uh, the program allowed for block sales where the veterans could buy land in a group, not individual. And this would allow them to buy more land uh, because even 7,500 a piece wasn't enough money to buy uh, much land at the time, even at that time. And these block sales were used by the crooks to commit fraud and to enrich themselves. And they were overseen by the commissioner of the land office personally, which allowed him to keep a hand on what was going on. So a reporter for a small newspaper called the Quero Record in South Texas heard of something unusual in 1954. He got a report that two Quero businessmen were entertaining black men, some black guys, after hours at the country club. And what he found out was that the two businessmen had paid the black caretaker at the club $10 for every veteran he could persuade to sign an application for purchase of land under the Veterans Land Act. So they were having this meeting at the country club after hours, and they were paying the guy, the, the janitor or caretaker of the club, $10 for every veteran of World War II that he could get to come to the meeting and sign the paperwork. Now, this was unusual for the time because in 1954, the country club was segregated. They wouldn't be having meetings with black veterans there likely. Uh, and the fact that it was after hours made it even more suspicious. So Towery, the, vet, the uh, newspaper guy, found out that the veterans were being paid anywhere from ten to three hundred dollars a piece to sign applications for the land grants. And in many cases these veterans were illiterate and didn't even know what they were signing. So they're basically being paid for their signatures. And I'll get into how the scam worked in a minute. So Towery took what he had learned and he went to the county attorney, a guy named Wiley Cheatham, who was not a chief. And he revealed, the a county attorney, Cheatham, admit, told the newspaper reporter, Towery, that he had been investigating this issue for about a year because he had been hearing rumors that local veterans were. Yeah. So Towery decided to check into it himself. This is Towery, the reporter, at least what he looked like in the 1950s. He made an appointment with Bascom Giles, the commissioner of the General Land Office. And he asked Giles if he knew anything about these strange meetings in Quero or about the veterans be getting bills for land they didn't know they had bought. Giles got defensive and told Towery that it wasn't his fault. He hadn't done anything wrong. There were some other guys who were up to no good. And Towery was confused and thought, well, why is he so defensive? I haven't even accused him of anything yet. I've just asked him if the land office knows what's going on. So he decided to print the first article, and there would go on to be about 10 or 11 more. And this is the copy of the article. All it says is investigation underway here on land deals. An investigation of alleged widespread irregularities in the Texas Veterans Land Program is underway in DeWitt County. The record has learned from authoritative sources. This set off several months more of wider investigations, and there ended up being an investigation by the Texas Attorney General, the Texas Department of Public Safety, the State Auditor's Office, and the State General Investigating Com Senate General Investigating Committee, and Texas Governor Alan Shivers. And they uncovered the mechanics of the scheme. And there were a few steps, basically, Land promoters, businessmen, like the two Quarrel businessmen, would buy cheap, unproductive land, land that was essentially worthless. They would get the state government and the land office to appraise the land for more than it was really worth, and they would sell it to the Veterans Land Bureau for that inflated price. So they would make a lot of money by selling overappraised land to the Land Bureau. And they would give kickbacks, which are bribes, 
to the Lansboro officials for going along with the scheme. Then these promoters would invite in these veterans, usually poor, illiterate veterans, black or Hispanic, uh, white as well, but people who may, maybe couldn't read very well, at least in English, would be easier to comment. And they would invite them in and they would pay them for their signatures on applications for the land. And the veterans wouldn't be told what they were doing, they would be told either they were getting free land or they were getting free benefits for a few hundred dollars, and all they had to do was sign. So the promoters would then complete the paperwork, they would pay the down payment for the land, and then they would lease the land back from the veterans, who were now the owners of the land, but they didn't know it, and they would pay the lease for three years. Because remember, you had to pay for three years before the land became yours. And then at the end of those three years, their plan was for the veterans to default on the purchases. Remember, it's a 40 year loan, not a three year loan. Their plan was for the veterans to default on the purchases because the veterans don't even know they're supposed to be making purchases. And then the land would revert back to the state because of the default. But the state would be holding worthless empty land. The land wasn't really worth anything. The veterans would be, their, their financial records would be ruined because they have defaulted on land uh, on these payments, but they wouldn't end up with the land either wouldn't be at theirs at the end of the three years. Now, that didn't work out as badly as the promoter's plan because this reporter uncovered the scheme and published uh, articles about it in 1954 and 1955. So, by the time it was over, um, in, I, I actually, it didn't take very long at all. It took a couple of months for it to be clear that Giles was corrupt. So Bascom Giles, the commissioner of the land office, resigned in January of 1955. And then in July of 1955, so less than a year later, he was convicted of theft and sentenced to six years in the state penitentiary. He reported to the Texas State Penitentiary at Huntsville in January 1956, and he was released from prison in December of 1958. And that made him the first elected state official in Texas to be incarcerated for crimes that he committed while in public office. Um, there was a report by the Attorney General and the State Auditor. It said, according to the official report, 591 veterans and 39 land sellers participated in the fraud. There were estimates, estimates later that almost 1,500 veterans uh, were scammed in the fraud uh, in about 125 total transactions worth about $10 million. Towery, who you see pictured here about 30 or 40 years later in life, uh, received the Pulitzer Prize for his reporting on the scam. The veterans, most of them actually turned out fine but because he had saved them and reported the scam in time, uh, they got to keep the bonuses that had been paid by the promoters and the title, uh, the promoters were forced to pay for the titles themselves to pay for the actual value, uh, to pay back the state the value of the land. So most of the veterans seem to have not ended up being harmed by the scandal in the end. So one more controversy and this is a recent one, and I'll get to it pretty quickly. Since 2011, the General Land Office has managed the Alamo in San Antonio. There were allegations of mismanagement under the previous caretakers of the Alamo, that was the Daughters of the Republic of Texas. So the management was transferred to the General Land Office. And then a few years later, the Alamo Cenotaph controversy transpired. This is the Cenotaph. It's a monument that was erected uh, in 1936 during the Texas Centennial Celebration. It was made by a local sculptor named Pompeo Cobini, and the monument was meant to celebrate the fallen heroes at the Alamo. And it bears the names of those that were known to have fought there in 1936. It was entitled The Spirit of Sacrifice, 
It has images of some of the Alamo garrison leaders, and it lists 187 names of known defenders. We now know with modern research that there were actually more than 187 people defending the Alamo when it fell. Uh, this is what it says, erected in memory of the heroes who sacrificed their lives at the Alamo, March 6, 1836, in the defense of Texas. They chose never to surrender nor retreat. These brave hearts with flags still proudly waving perished in the flames of immortality that their high sacrifice might lead to the founding of this Texas. So the controversy here began around 2018, and this is not a scandal like fraud or bribery or any of the other stuff I was talking about. This is just a disagreement about what to do with the Alamo. Have any of you ever visited the Alamo? Okay, good. So you have some visual representation. Um, if you go and look at the Alamo, one of the first things that might strike you if you don't know what to expect is it looks almost disappointing in the sense that um, you have the famous visage, right? You have the famous church. But otherwise, it just looks like you're in a park downtown. It just looks like a normal downtown scene. And it's not, it's not what you expect. You have to really use your imagination to try to imagine what it would have looked like in 1836. Um, so what they wanted to do, they approved this $450 million Alamo redevelopment project and they wanted to redesign that little downtown space so it would look more like it did back in 1836. And so you would still have the famous facade of the Alamo Chapel that everybody recognizes, postcards around the world, world, and you would still have the long barracks. You can see those today. But then they would have cleared off all of this space because this, was the interior of the Alamo mission back 200 years ago, right? Today it's just downtown San Antonio, but this was open space inside the walled compound 200 years ago, and they wanted to restore it so it would look something like that, so that visitors would see the past, right? They would see what, it, they would be able to see more of what it was like in the past. But in order to do that, in order to do all that, they would have had to move the cenotaph because it's right there in front of the chapel, right there in front of the, um, the compound. And this idea of moving the cenotaph in order to do all that reconstruction was a controversial idea. Uh, George P. Bush, who was a Republican, uh, even had words with Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who was also a Republican, so even Republicans were disagreeing with each other openly, publicly, about whether or not this was a good idea. Here's another model of the plan, so you can see what I'm talking about. Today, if you go, this is just a park, and there are actually buildings everywhere. There's some weird wax museum. There's the Crockett Hotel here. And so they wanted to remake it so that it would look more like this again, because this is what the Alamo mission really looked like uh, back then. But remember, the cenotaph is somewhere right about here. And this is where the defenders of the Alamo fell, where many of them died, and where the bodies were. Uh, actually, the bodies were burned somewhere right around there. But this is where they fell, defending the Alamo. So should the cenotaph be moved? That was the big controversy. Uh, Texas Land Commissioner George Bush defended the plan. He said relocating the 1930s monument <clears throat> was essential to keep it from crumbling. He said the Cenotaph's new location would be more historically accurate than its current location north of the Alamo Crowns. And he said the new location is one of the sites where the Mexican forces burned the bodies of the Texans killed in the battle. And he said so the Cenotaph would actually be relocated and moved to where the funeral pyre is where the revolutionaries' bodies were burned. The cenotaph would actually be fixed for the first time and reconstructed in a way in terms of its foundations so that it's around for hundreds of years. So his, his argument seemed to be that he thought moving it would be putting it in a more historically accurate location, but the, dis, the people who disagreed said, no, if you move it, it'll be out of sight. People won't even know where it is. They won't see it anymore. And he also argued that there, there were some sort of structural or foundational problems with it that needed to be fixed 
and it had to be moved in order to fix them. And I'm not sure what he's referring to. So on September 22, 2021, the Texas Historical Commission voted against moving the cemetery. Uh, the agency whose commissioners are appointed by the Texas governor has authority over the Alamo that covers archeological work, architecture, and the treatment of historic sites. The commission chair, John Now, said monuments to the fallen are placed where they fell. And what he means is the cenotaph should be kept here where the Alamo defenders died, not moved somewhere else in the city. And since that killed the plan to move the cenotaph, that killed the whole plan. And there is no longer any plan to renovate the Alamo grounds and restore them to what they looked like in 80. 